What's up, everyone? Welcome to another little episode of Half Hour with Astro Theater Company. We are joined today by amazing Kansas City artist and dear, dear friend of mine, David Gomez. Hello, Taylor, and the earbuds of all. Hello, radio <laughs> world. What's up? How are you? The dreaded I'm doing, question. <laughs> I'm doing, I am doing well. I'm happy and healthy and hopeful, but also just remaining vigilant, just remaining aware of all the things, attempting to remain aware of everything that's happening in the world. And, yes. Um, and making sure our democracy and the arts and, you know, uh, my lungs are stable. Amen. That's all we can really do these days, you know. Um, <laughs> D- David, uh, so let's get right into it. You're, you're born and raised Kansas City boy, right? I was technically born in Topeka, in North oh. Topeka, in Stormont Vale. In, <laughs> um, in, yeah, this very um, this Mexican community in Topeka. And I lived there for probably um, for three years. It was fabulous um, when yeah. I was a toddler. Um, and then my family moved to Overland Park, um, um, where I sort of was in the Shawnee Mission School District. And yeah, I spent most of my formative years, um, you know, my full sentence years uh, in Kansas City. Um, sure. Very cool. And um, when did you, was there a moment, a formative moment when you decided that like performing arts, performing the theater was for you? Like, was there a, a TV show or an actor, or actress that you were like, holy shit, I want to do that. Or like, I'm in love with this. You know, I think the wand chooses the wizard in some way as well. <laughs> but um, it's almost a little cliche. I will say that maybe for me it was like, um, not exactly a performing bug, but it was like, I was in my sister's dance class. It's like actually on video. This moment is recorded on a camera somewhere where it was like, it was watch week. And I was there basically and saw my sister and like attempted to upstage her or something. I guess I would still keep doing the rest of my life. And I just joined the dance class and I just loved dancing. I was definitely taken to see like arts things. Like I remember seeing like, um, a production of like The Sound of Music and being like, wait, that movie? We do that live? Like, I think that was also mm-hmm. a moment for me. I grew up with like a lot of musical VHS is when you're a kid, they're always like singing the alphabet at you and stories at you, like liking music <laughs> when you're a kid. It's also how you, <laughs> it's how you learn and absorb the world. And yeah. so um, I think that for me, scenes a show also was a big moment where I was like, oh, the thing in the TV is a large community event. Oh, no one told me. Okay, we're gonna have to keep coming to these. So, hold on, just to backtrack, are you saying you had like been observing Anna's dance class and you're like, okay, I know the combo, I'm ready to go. And so yes. you- <laughs> Yeah, I just joined the bar, like didn't ask permission. I also think that maybe that will be a theme we'll talk about. I think part of, I think being an arts person is like, <laughs> it's easier to ask uh, forgiveness and permission and like okay. finding the space and being like, you know what? Like I'm going to be a part of the space and like I'm bringing myself to this a dance class at age three. And then and, the, and also my parents do too. I wonder, it became both me and my sister were both really liked the arts. And so, you know, when you're always, especially your younger sibling, whatever they do, like you want to do. And so I just started dancing and love and I loved dancing. And I also had, I have no idea who this teacher was, but I really wanted to do ballet and like, I was like, well, I was like, I'm an artiste, you know, like I was the classical world is for me. Sure. Um, I just picture you like studying Hamlet and (laughs) and practicing at the bar. I I think I had like a George Balanchine coloring book. Like, I'm not kidding you. Like I was like, I was always a really ancient child is also, I think another thing. So I think the arts also communing with things older that seemed more important than me was something I was into. I don't know why. But um, I had a teacher that was like, you're good at ballet, but you know, by the time you're 22, like your knees are gonna give out and your career will be over by the time you're 25. Oh my God. Which is good advice for children, I think, because I was like, oh, this doesn't pe- seem very longer lasting. I want something that like lasts longer. Mm. And then another teacher was like, well, in musical theater, your knees give out when you're 40. So <laughs> go to tap class. And I was like, you know what? That feels like longer lasting. Mm. And I think I just kept having moments um, it, that led me towards writing or wanting to like create or produce or own my own intellectual property or own my own creativity. I kept having more of those aha moments. It's like, oh, I want something longer lasting. 
them performing. Yes. And I kind of had to keep having those or am still having those um, ever since that moment. I was so attracted to performing, but I think the intangibility of it or the lack of permanence for it, I think has always kind of haunted me, even from that very first moment. Yeah, totally. When did you decide that you wanted to go and study this thing or that it was, did you have a moment when you realized that this could be like a, a lifestyle, a profession as opposed to a hobby? Uh, yes, and I also think that when I was a kid, for whatever reason, for whatever resources, I was pursuing it like as professionally as I could, like mm -hmm. as a kid. So like, I would get the, the I, Lord knows it doesn't exist, Casey stage. I would like, mom, look at the trades. And I was like <laughs> highlighting auditions for me and like, you know, yeah. wanting to do it as a kid and getting like, I think there was also a moment when I was like, had an agent at like 12, like all kids. Like I also call myself like a former local child star. It's like how I felt. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but uh, so I will say that like, I think from a really young age, I was like, oh, and maybe not even in a healthy way. I was like, this is my life. Like mm. this fourth grade classroom I'm in is just a, a stepping stone because I'm leaving because I had a matinee on Wednesday. <laughs> like I always kind of felt like- Wasn't that like the biggest power trip in the world when you had to leave school for a show? I, I was such a, a diva at age 16. I was like, I've got to go to the Kaufman. I <laughs> you just like throw keywords at your teacher. You're like, rehearsal, rehearsal, tech week, rehearsal. And they're like, get out, just leave. <laughs> and I also remember like, this is like a segue, but I think speaks to the, the way I was planning or orienting my life is I remember my fourth grade teacher was like, oh, uh, the parent-teacher conferences was like, David, like satisfactory, like A plus honor student kid, but <laughs> there's always a, an addendum. He's like, he can't sit still in class. Like he makes these sounds underneath his desk, especially during math. He's like, he's like, <laughs> he just, I think he needs to go on like um, some sort of medicine. And my mom, who's like a pharmacist was like, I don't like, no, like this is not, not making sense. Like David, what sounds are you making under your desk? Like, what is this mystery? And I was like, oh, Oh, I was practicing my time steps. I, <laughs> I didn't realize Especially you could hear doing me. Like, math. <laughs> I, was pra I was practicing my time steps during long division. So I do think that mm. um, it, was, it was a dream I'd always had that like I was determined not to let go of, to keep so, pursuing. And that creativity was going to find its way out of you through whatever avenue possible, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you went to school, we shared an alma mater at Pace University, and you graduated 2014, 2014. Yeah. Got it. And you studied musical theater there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there, and is there a minor in writing? Spanish as well. <laughs> and a minor in Spanish, absolutely. <laughs> um, was there, is there a writing class or a writing major at Pace? Again, it kind of comes right back down to like that same instance of like get into a room, figure out what can work for you. Yeah. Um, there became kind of like a writing click or there were enough of us that were kind of like singer songwriter or, or played instruments or had experience doing songwriting enough that there became like a one semester writing course. So they just tried out to be like, it, there was like a little bit of flexibility uh, compared to um, other sort of BFA programs. And so we kind of almost had this weird little BMI class of people, mm. um, but it was an actual class we could attend. And, um, and that was really um, lovely. And also arriving in New York when I was 18, my biggest discovery is that I thought that writers were dead or <laughs> 70. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> like I didn't realize, it, like again, it was like, I was like, oh, meeting, uh, just or even going to cabarets, like get, meeting an art scene, meeting other professionals, being like, oh, people are pursuing really specific careers and really specific projects. Mm -hmm. That was something that when you're a community theater kid, you're like, well, we're doing Annie. This is the script from 1977. This is my life now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think moving to New York, I was like really enamored by like young professionals and specifically young writers. And I had always been sort of writing uh, musicals and stories. And so trying to put that all together was, um, for me, felt very really, like natural and exciting. Mm-hmm. And uh, when do you feel like you made a shift from, or do you, have you made a shift from like performer into writer? Because you also 
are required to sing and create as you're writing. So that I count that as performing. And you did a, a set a couple of weeks ago uh, with the Latino Arts Festival. Yes, yeah. Um, I did a sort of, uh, again, we're figuring out what theater is now, I guess like a virtual, yeah. or an, I don't even know. I just, yeah, uh, outside of a mural at Cafe Corazon, um, because I was like, oh, how can I do something to share my songs for my community? Ideally, I would have like other people that aren't me do them because like that's the way I like to have my process is I love working with actors. I love working with singers. I love working with people who aren't me. But I was like, in order to safely share my music, yeah, I had to mm. stand up there and grab my instrument and like sing my songs. And yeah. um, I do think that when I decided to pursue writing again, I think I was like, oh, I'll never... I'll never have to like use these these chords again. Yeah, I can, yeah. you know, I can. Like, it's a little uh, kind of like relief when you're like, oh well, on this project, I'm I'm, I'm not performing, so I can <laughs> I don't have to focus so much on on my body. <laughs> I do think though, uh, and I think this. I hope this is answering the question. The more I keep pursuing writing, the more I keep realizing is like, this you are always auditioning, like like lo yeah. like musical theater especially it's very ancient like you have to do a backwards audition you as a songwriter gotta make the producer believe in you like yeah. like ultimately i like to keep um i keep my performing side like in the passenger seat or sometimes mm -hmm. the trunk I, or like, <laughs> but i want driving like riding the car or driving yeah. the car is, is what i where i am and i think also i think that i'm sure you can attest this in new york as a performer you feel so disposable like I remember feeling incredibly disposable yeah. um, uh, while at a really young formative age. And I think that, and also as a Latinx performer, Chicanx performer, um, I realized really quickly that if I wanted to um, use my family's background or parts of myself that the industry had no nuance for, that I would have to do that on my own terms. Sure. And that that wasn't a depressing thing. Um, that it was just um, a true thing. Sure. I mean, I think that's, I think it's a beautiful opportunity to be able to like create specifically um, nuanced, like you were talking about work yourself and to, you know, maybe create space for other folks and other performers um, who identify the way you do and, and maybe make them feel less disposable. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went, you went to grad school at NYU, right? Mm -hmm. And because I wanted to get um, an MFA specifically in musical writing, because I, I also kind of felt that like the amount of like academic energy I had, like had an expiration date. <laughs> or like, <laughs> sure. or that it, I don't know, it felt kind of like do or die. And at the same time, I also wanted kind of like, um, it's such a collaborative art form. Like I, I, I was also, I think, pursuing meeting other collaborators. And I um, met a composer named Judy Obermuller, who I'm still lo love working with and wrote with. And um, yeah, and, we've, and we met a, our collaborator, Laura Barati there. So I think I also kind of was still hunting for um, uh, fellow travelers as much as like technique and figuring out how to turn, you know, what was raw talent I, I felt into something actually, um, process based or you know yeah um, and and so i and i also wanted i just pursued it right um right out of school because it was this kind of, i don't know i felt kind of do or die about it yeah i think that's a good point about um the <laughs> energy academically having like an expiration date i i definitely <laughs> feel that as well uh especially when like what you're learning is so personal like so much of art school is is so personal it's not like going to school for econ or accounting or business which i'm sure is stressful in a different way but um when you're learning you know process or learning from other actors or artists that you are inspired by it becomes very personal and very about you and your experience and how you see yourself and how you operate in the world um do you feel like you had any kind of shift from undergrad to grad school about like the way the kind of work that you wanted to do oh yeah absolutely and again it also comes down to meeting other writers or like i met writers who for whom any commercial success would have felt like an embarrassment to them and when and i am such like a let me entertain you like mm. musical theater baby that like meeting people who were just truly process-based 
or meeting people who, who identified in performance art more than musical theater or meeting people who uh, were only playwrights. You know, I do think that like just getting to really champion and experience other people's art or other people's processes made me want to be like, oh yeah, like I guess like, hmm, instead of having the dream of, I want to be a Broadway composer, maybe a more useful sentence is, is like, oh, I want to have a healthy process with a project I believe in. Mm. Like, that's a really different sentence, right? And I do think yeah. when you go from a performer to writer, and there's so many people that juggle it well, uh, it's hard to turn that part of your brain off that's like, everyone needs to love this. Or like, this must be a success. Like, yeah. it's hard to get rid of that. And Redefining that, what success means to you is a, a journey that I'm still on as well. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, and to, to your point about, you know, different disciplines coming together and learning from those different viewpoints, that's something that, in my opinion, college arts programs do not do very well. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Because, I mean, this is how it was at our alma mater, and I've talked to a lot of other of our friends who went to other conservatories or just even state schools, um, but the, the programs become very segregated. And I think that probably has to do with the leaders fighting for money and maybe representation or space, but there's this very competitive nature that sort of secludes projects by major, which makes no sense to me. Yeah, and or in no way reflects like the real world, I think. Yeah, that, like, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely think that and, and also doesn't reflect like the real interests of of students. Like like hilariously, I had to study Spanish and theater in separate rooms and no one was ever like, hey, that would be like, have you ever tried putting those two together? Like, mm. like, like, you know, or in many ways, like I was, I think for one of my Spanish, like I, had to, I could write this essay, but I was, I went to the professor and I was like, how about I turn this book and like, I'll adapt this chapter to a musical. Like, I do think that like, yeah. um, I, I do think that a lot of us really yearn to put our disparate interests into a box called theater. Yeah. And when you show up studying a box called theater, um, I think some people, when they make a curriculum for that, it's like, it's Shakespeare, it's this, it's this, it's this, instead of a why not both and, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, it, it's just so strange because in the real world, we're all going to be fighting for the same jobs anyway. And why not start that process of learning from one another as humans, artists, and also just across disciplines? Why not start that earlier? Because I feel like it's just going to only elevate the the product and the education of everyone. So I don't know. That's something that I have a big issue with, but I I don't know the best way to solve it. <laughs> and I also think that something now that we're in this moment where it's like all the rules from theater have been <laughs> like the book, like the book, like the Hope's Books book has caught flames. Like there are actually no rules. Yeah. Truly because there are no theaters right now. And yep. like um I, I do have to think to myself that like, would I a year ago have been like, hmm, you know what should be at the top of my list is a community-based project in Spanish outside at a mural for this one arts festival that um, no one in New York would recognize on my resume. Would that be the thing that I care about? Hmm. And I think that I had to have this moment to be like, why wasn't that at the top of my list? Like, why wasn't my community at the top of my list for what I wanted to mm. share and do? Why was the industry at the top of my list? Well, we're and now of... that the industry's gone, isn't that mm. maybe beautiful? Like, isn't there yeah. a discovery in that crisis? Or that's what I'm trying to work on now, yeah. in a way. There's suddenly so many more options and uh, priorities sort of become a little more clear, I think, without the, the battle for employment or recognition since mm -hmm. it's not possible on a normal level right now. But I also love to see the um, the ingenuity that like people are coming up with, with public performance. And suddenly we're like exploring what it's like to do a play outside or at a cemetery. And it's like, it's interesting because that kind of work has been happening like forever, you know? Um, but suddenly it's like a new and edgy thing because we can't gather inside. So what does it look like to continue to like, I don't know, broach those styles of storytelling and maybe in a, in a less conventional 
way in a theater. And I hope that we continue to, to search for those things after the pandemic so we don't just go back into, you know, our traditional style proscenium theater all the time. It certainly has its place, but. Yeah, you know how there's those, um, uh, those cereal boxes that are like, oops, all berries, you know? <laughs> I feel yes. like the theater maybe is like, oops, all immersive, like this year, like everyone's <laughs> like, oops, all daring, you know, like, I yeah. think that, um, or oops, all accessible, like it's online now, like, yeah. I'm sure, I don't know if you can speak to this with Astra, but like, do small fledgling theater companies consider their AV department when they're founded? Exactly. And yeah. why not, and why was that not normal? Did, did off-Broadway theater companies or, or places with huge reputations consider how they can reach South Korea, how they can reach teenagers, mm -hmm. how they can reach children through right. the internet, which is very democratizing. Um, I don't know, do, I, I haven't quite processed that, but that's something I've been thinking about too. No, I think, it's, I think it's really interesting and I hope that it continues to, again, I hope that trend survives the pandemic because it is more accessible for, and not only just like physically, but also like, let's consider people who are like low income or can't find a babysitter or work the night shift and can never go to a theater. Like, I think there should be a larger conversation about like, how do we make sure as many folks as possible have access to the work we're creating? And how can we do that in a way um, that also makes the, the artists involved feel safe, but also challenged, you know? And maybe I'm wrong, but I seem to recall, or even maybe recall myself feeling this way, that like for real theater artists, like the internet was like, oh, that's an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Like, like, oh, what I do is like live and in person, like <laughs> darling, like, like you must buy a ticket to see me. And if anyone films me, like Pedal Pun will yell at you, like the internet <laughs> is for. The internet is for, for plebeians. And, for and, TikTok. And like, <laughs> yes, oh, well, I, would, I, I would never dance for my screen. Like, I'm, yeah. like, I don't know why. In my brain, that's the way the American theater used to talk is like a British game, which again, makes no sense. Yeah, but like, no, but you're true. You're, there's, you're definitely onto something there. Your observation about what our priorities of being perceived as a different cast of performer, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, is, mm -hmm. is something that I hope folks are also sort of, I don't know, untangling for themselves during this, like the great stillness that is happening right now. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, when you write or when you're creating something or crafting a story, do you ever consider like what space it will be in physically or like community that you want like a target audience? And how important is that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean like on just like a functional level to like, talk to your collaborator or take a meeting with the director or anyone else. It's great to have sort of like, like a, I, I say Barbie dream house of um, mm -hmm. where you think this will be. But that also affects the way, especially with musicals, I approach like ensemble writing or um, just like truly nitty gritty stuff. Like who's gonna understudy this role? Like when this is an actual physical thing, mm. I think as a, as, a, as a writer, I kind of love being put like in a box. Like, I love a limitation. It I actually, I think, ups my game. And so imagining what the limitation will even be, I think, can lead me towards um, hopefully exciting solutions or sometimes just <laughs> frustration. Sure. Um, and is there any, like, um, anything you feel like you'd like to see come out of this pandemic? Like, on the other side, what, what does the theater look like in, the, in your Barbie dream house of a post-pandemic <laughs> theater? <laughs> uh, what's it look like? Who's there? Who does it employ? Yeah, I think, I think it, interestingly enough, I think it looks maybe um, a little more, I don't want to say community theater, but it looks, it looks more community driven or it, it doesn't um, prioritize diversity as an afterthought. Also like the word diversity is like, too vague for me. Like, mm -hmm. I think that ultimately um, the American theater can't just decide to have new buzzwords for the same Eugene O'Neill play, if that makes sense. Like, I think that ultimately we need to be thinking about, and I also being an author is different than being a producer, but we need to be thinking about for whom are we doing this and why? And why does this community need to hear this story today? 
we've woken up in a really different today. Mm. And it's like, is this story worth risking your life to do? Is this story risking someone else's life to do? That's a high stake. That's much higher stakes than yeah. it used to be. Um, and I do think theater should still be a lark and laughter and engaging. Like, I don't think it should suddenly become a self-serious um, uh, emotional, I don't even, it, it doesn't look like that. It looks vibrant and, and colorful, but um, incredibly conscious about how human bodies are being treated with the actors on stage and even how this community is being served. I love that. I could talk to you all day about all of this, but <laughs> we, we have to wrap up a little bit. Um, is there, uh, what projects are you currently working on? Where can we find you? Is there anything you want to plug? Um, I am currently working on a musical called Shoot for the Moon. And, um, and I've been doing it with John Michael Lyles, who uh, is a dear friend. And we've been partnering with Musical Theater Factory in a program called Makers um, to develop it. And they do a lot of great online programming. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're like um, at Musical Theater Factory on Instagram or you can find their things. And, and I'm excited. I think I'll be also partnering with them in maybe an event in January and stuff like that. And that's been really fascinating to have um, development. But yeah. while we're school, like they're, I think, have some really exciting, um, they don't have, answers so much to how we're doing it, but I love the idea of jumping into the internet void with development with this project, with John Michael and them, that's been really cool. Um, and um, I've also been doing a musical called Miss Havisham's Wedding, um, which we, uh, which uh, Jude and Laura and I, who had met at NYU, we actually brought to Kansas City, um, I think like in 2018, mm -hmm. to develop it here. And that um, was like a huge joy. Um, we don't know what's next for that, but you know, in the great hereafter. I would, I can't wait for that project to keep taking steps forward. And as a songwriter, I have been pursuing, um, it kind of happened by accident this summer when I was um, just sort of had extra time and was writing songs is um, I'm beginning a musical uh, commission process called Your Song. And I basically can get commissioned to write any song for anyone. And I did one for a wedding uh, or like, I love or, this. Or for, and it happened because um, my boyfriend, um, his close friend gave birth to um, a baby and we couldn't be there to like celebrate it. And I was like, oh, well, it's a really good way to show like goodwill. Um, and I was like, oh, like I can write a song and I can send it and share it. And like, yeah. it's been this really interesting process of seeing what it means to take musical storytelling um, as just um, as an artist and how do you make events become musical stories is kind of like something mm. so if you out there in the interwebs are curious about that then we'd love to turn your canceled event into a musical moment you can find me at gomez underscore z david it's like david with a z um <laughs> or you can email your song media at gmail.com yes you can tell everyone this is your song oh you have the pitch and everything i love it We'll, we'll throw all those links when we, when we post that and, and let oh, them find you. Um, well, thank you so much. You're such a joy. You're so wonderful. And it's so lovely to chat with you about what you're up to and, and what your hopes are for um, this crazy job that we do. <laughs> I know. This was such a lark. And I can't wait to, I can't wait to hear the other people. And um, um, I love a podcast. So I can't be waiting to hear what the other guests have to say. It's pretty cool. I can't wait for everyone to check it out. Well, we will chat soon, David. Have a good rest of your day. All right.